Welcome back, everyone, to eighth monthly meeting of this group. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Anne-Sophie Devey, who's going to speak today about interrogating functional molecules and molecular machines using AFM. So, Anne-Sophie, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, James. I will share my screen. So today I will uh, talk about um, probing synthetic molecular machines and functional molecules with AFM, and more especially with a single molecule for spectroscopy uh, to have information on force motion dynamics and function of those uh, molecules. So I will uh, start um, with a brief introduction to single molecule for spectroscopy. I will explain the basic principle. So we have um, a molecule that is uh, grafted on the surface. It can be grafted or it can be uh, simply physisorbed on the surface, depending on uh, what we want to, to evidence. Um, but we have a molecule on the surface. We approach the AFM tip towards the surface and we uh, gently push on, on the molecule. And if uh, sufficient interactions have developed during the contact, when we will try to, um, to, to uh, um, move the tip away from the surface, the molecule will stay attached to both the tip and the surface, and we will stretch the molecule. You have here a movie showing uh, what's happened. And we stretch, we stretch the molecule until uh, the weakest bond of the system breaks. And here, for example, this is the bond between the tip and the molecule. So we have here the, the, the molecule on the surface, but it can also be uh, the link between the molecule and the surface. And then in this case, the molecule is transferred to the, uh, the AFM tip, or it can also be one of the bonds uh, inside the molecule. And in this case, we break, uh, we break the molecule. So the system has to be uh, designed so that the weakest bond of the system is the bond that is of uh, interest. And what we record is a force curve uh, as a function of the extension of the molecule. Uh, and in this curve, you have here this um, profile, which is the mechanical response of the molecule. And in this uh, mechanical profile, you can, you can have an indication of uh, intramolecular uh, bond breaking. You can have information on um, supramolecular reorganization of the molecule, and of course, a specific bond rupture. And this is done in solution. It means that um, for biological molecules, for example, uh, we can work in, uh, in, in buffers or in uh, native medium. Uh, I cannot move. Okay. So why? Uh, studying single functional molecules. There are three main uh, objectives. The first one is for technological applications because there is a limit to uh, miniaturization and uh, a day will come when a tiny piece of matter will be really too small to fabricate uh, a device or a machine. And we can imagine that uh, the single molecule becomes the, the device or the machine itself. We have also uh, fundamental questions like uh, this one, do the phenomena that we observe at the scale of a single molecule obey the laws we know for ensemble of species or will they force us to rethink our understanding of physics and uh, chemistry? Because of course for uh, chemists, uh, the unit is uh, the mole. So we have an ensemble of molecules. And when we uh, use classical techniques, like NMR, for example, we have an average behavior on billions of molecules. If we study single molecules, we can uh, evidence subgroups of molecules. And for uh, the very same molecule, we can even uh, evidence different behavior 
of the same molecule. Sometimes the molecule will behave like this, and sometimes it will behave like that. And the third uh, objective is to provide um, guidelines for the design of synthetic molecules that uh, mimic or even surpass the performance of biological uh, molecules. This is a general slide showing um, our um, research activities uh, in single molecule for spectroscopy, which is just the, the core technique that we use. Um, we are interested in measuring molecular interactions. It can be in uh, biological species between uh, antibodies and antigens, for example, or also between synthetic species. We are interested by single molecule uh, mechanics uh, to develop molecular sensors. In the past, uh, we have been uh, working on a single molecule patterning. And more recently, we uh, focused on uh, the study of molecular machines. And of course, today I will talk about uh, this topic. So molecular machines are able to uh, rectify random motion to produce directional uh, forces and uh, carry out macroscopic tasks. And we were interested by this question, can submolecular Brownian motions in a single synthetic small machine be harnessed to produce forces? And can we measure the mechanical work that is generated by uh, the molecule? And to answer these questions, we have been collaborating with David Lee on this uh, H-bonded rotaxane. So we have here the axle of the molecule, the ring. Uh, we have here on one of the stopper um, disulfide groups for anchoring uh, on a gold uh, surface. And on the ring, there is here uh, a titer to uh, pull with the AFM tip. We have two station uh, on the axle. Uh, this one, the green one, is a fumaramide site, and this is the uh, most bi um, preferable uh, binding site for the ring. It means that uh, most of the time, 95% of the time, the ring um, binds to uh, this station. But th this station can also uh, accommodate the, the ring. And the idea was to uh, pull on the ring to make it travel to the other uh, station. And that's the, the results of the pulling curves. Uh, you can see here uh, the curve, the pulling curve. Here, uh, this is the classical behavior when we pull on a long uh, molecule. And you can see that on this profile, we have a small peak that corresponds to the rupture of the hydrogen bonds between uh, the ring and uh, the station. And we have uh, done this in different solvents uh, and the results agree with the difference in polarity um, of the solvents, which proves that this is indeed the H bonds that uh, we are uh, breaking. Now, um, if we stop the pulling, so we don't um, pull until detaching uh, here uh, the titer um, uh, from the AFM tip. We stop the pulling before the detachment. We can do pulling and relaxing cycles. So we pull, we have this pulling profile, and then before the detachment, we relax the system. And these are the results. So this is the pulling curve uh, in blue, like the one I showed you um, the slide before. So we pull and then we uh, relax. So uh, we, um, we move the tip again towards, towards the surface. And what we expect is that the force decreases because we decrease the tension uh, in the, here, the, the linker. So here you, you have in uh, the black rows, this is the direction of uh, the tip, so towards the surface. And here, uh, this um, blue rose shows um, the force that is exerted on the tip. Because here you see that we still apply forces, even if we decrease the distance, there is still force that applies on, on the ring. So if we progressively uh, decrease the tension here uh, in uh, the linker, 
the force should be continuously decreased. But you can see here that suddenly we have an increase of force here, and then again, again it decreases. And the only explanation for that is that uh, suddenly we were here and the ring has traveled back to its preferred binding site against the load that is applied by the cantilever. Because you see here that we still apply load. Um, and here, the force that is exerted by the ring is in the opposite direction uh, of the load that is exerted on the ring. It means that this is really a force that is produced against the mechanical load applied by the FM tip. And the ring is able to shuttle back to the station against a force of 30 piconewtons, which corresponds to a work of six kilocal per mole. So to, to, uh, to explain you, this is really like, uh, th this is a famous comics in, in Belgium, Boulebille. Um, so, um, and um, you can imagine that you, um, you, you, you take your uh, dog on a leash and uh, suddenly the, the dog uh, starts to run. And when it does this, uh, he uh, carried away the, the boy here. Uh, and this is really what uh, happens with uh, the, the road accent. So uh, the dog here, Bill, uh, is the ring of the road accent and the boy here, Bull, is the FM tip. So the, the ring really shuttles back to the station and uh, moving the tip uh, in the, the direction of uh, the shuttling. So if I come back to my uh, question, yes, the answer is yes. Submolecular bias bronian motion in a single synthetic small machine can be harnessed to uh, generate work. And uh, in this specific case, for a loading rate of uh, 500 piconewtons per second, uh, the rotaxan is able to use almost all the energy available from hydrogen bonding to perform work along the direction of the applied load. So everything is, is converted into mechanical work. Um, and here we um, analyzed in much more uh, details. This is uh, much recent work. Uh, we analyzed in much details uh, the, the pulling relaxing curves. Um, and we evidenced that, uh, so you have here uh, this small peak that, uh, which I showed you before, and that corresponds to uh, the breaking of the hydrogen bonds. And the distance between here, these two uh, parts of the curves, corresponds to the distance that, that is traveled by the ring. And here you can see that we have a double distribution, one around four uh, nanometers, which in fact corresponds to the distance between the two stations. But we have also uh, one peak uh, at two nanometers, so in the middle of uh, the thread. And we have also uh, so analyzed the, in details the profiles. And you can see here that we can evidence three states. So this is, in fact, like a zoom uh, on, 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 on the peak of the hydrogen bond rupture. So we have three states. So we have here um, one state. Uh, here, uh, the detachment from the, the first station in green. And then here, when the, the ring is on the other station, and you can see here an intermediate state during the pulling, but also during the relaxing. So those uh, fluctuations uh, between the states reveal, in fact, another interacting site uh, at the middle of the, of the thread that, in fact, involves the two oxygen atoms uh, here in the, in, in the thread. And in fact, those hydrogen bonds are in very low. And this is very difficult to evidence such um, uh, low hydrogen bonds uh, with ether oxygen by other uh, techniques. So with this, we have shown that 
the composition of the thread can uh, really influence the, the shuttling dynamics by slowing down the ring motion between the two uh, principal uh, binding sites, which are uh, this one and this one. This is another uh, system. This is still a rotaxen, uh, but this is a noligo rotaxen fold damage. Uh, this has been uh, synthesized by uh, Fraser Stoddart. So we have um, here in red a polyether chain um, bearing DNP donor groups that fold this way through a series of acceptor rings, which are the famous uh, blue boxes of, um, of Stoddart. So this is both a rotaxen, uh, and this is also a um, folded structure. So we have been uh, pulling on this uh, system, and this is the results. You can see here on the force curves, we have several peaks and the number of peaks in fact corresponds to the number of uh, interactions here uh, in the system and you can see that we have an alternation of higher and smaller peak higher smaller higher and smaller and we um, attribute this to um, so the, the the higher peak are the rupture of the interactions between um, the um, the DNP and the, um, the ring. So we break this uh, interaction between uh, the, two, uh, uh, the two parts. And once this interaction is broken, the opposite one, so this one here, becomes weakened. So this is much more easily to break the, the opposite uh, interaction here once this one is uh, broken. And the, um, the difference uh, in length between the fully open uh, system and the folded system uh, exactly corresponds to uh, the, the distance here between uh, the peaks, which proves that this is indeed this uh, interaction that we, uh, that we break and that we can evidence. Sorry. Uh, now, if we uh, zoom on, on, on the peak, so we zoom on uh, one of those uh, peak, which is the rupture of the uh, interaction, and we so we we uh, pull and relax the system. So here you see the direction. Here we pull on the molecule. We relax the system. We pull. We relax. We pull. We relax many times. So pulling, relaxing, pulling, relaxing. You can see here that there are uh, fluctuations, and believe me, this is not noise. <laughs> uh, this is something which is relevant to the molecule. Uh, you have a zoom here um, on, on, on this part. Here, this is noise, and here, these are fluctuations. And fluctuations means that, in fact, the force decreases because we break the interaction, but you can see that just after, suddenly, the force increases so we have decreases increases and so on which corresponds to the molecules that we uh, we open we break the interaction but during um, the the tip that is moving away the molecule is able is able to rebind uh, the, uh, the the two parts so while we pull the molecule pulls on the cantilever to remake the uh, interactions and this is those uh, fluctuations. So the molecule it means that the molecule is able to produce force against the mechanical load that is exerted by the FM cantilever to remake the interaction, and it is able to do this um, four thousand and three hundred times per second. So. Uh, more than 4,000 times per second, the molecule pulls on the cantilever to rebind, and we try to break the interaction with the AFM tip. Uh, we can measure, in fact, the force that uh, the molecule is able to produce. So this is this, um, this quantity. Uh, so this is uh, 60 piconewtons. This is the force that we 
exert with the FM tip. And here, this is the force that is uh, produced by the molecule. So in average, this is 25 piconewtons against the mechanical load of uh, 50 piconewtons. And the transition for this uh, fluctuation is less than 10 uh, microseconds. And if we compare to the literature for uh, biological molecules, um, we use loading rates of um, thousand, uh, so 10, uh, 10 to 3 uh, to 10 to 5 uh, piconewtons per second. So this is the speed of pulling. Um, which is in fact 100 to 1,000 times higher than the loading rates that are used to um, study uh, folding proteins, for example. Uh, then we have uh, pools with different rates on, on, on the molecule. So we have uh, used different loading rates. So the loading rate is the rate at which the, for at which the force is applied. Um, and you have here the classical behavior that is observed for um, biological molecules. So this is uh, all the data that are in gray or black. So uh, we ha uh, you have two uh, regimes. So uh, a regime here uh, at um, low loading rates um, where the force is relatively constant. It means that you pull uh, very slowly, and you pull slower than the time scale of the interactions. So the interaction has the, enough time to uh, remake many times during uh, the pooling. And um, here, this is the kinetic regime, which corresponds to a situation when you pull faster than the time scale of the bond. And you can see uh, in red, these are the results for the rotaxane. And you can see that even for very high loading rates, um, the kinetic regime is not rich yet. So it means that the rotaxane uh, is a very, very dynamic uh, system, able to rebind many times, uh, even against a pulling force. And also, the equilibrium regime corresponds to very high forces. So we have here a very uh, dynamic and robust molecule thanks to the interlocked structure. This is because in fact, um, we have this interlocked structure that um, pre-organize the structure and makes that uh, even if we break the interaction, the two uh, partners, the two components of the interactions um, stay in close proximity even after having a um, broken the interaction and they can rebind uh, very uh, easily. So the oligorotaxons have the potential to exceed the performance of natural um, folded molecules, uh, at least for this kind of uh, application. Um, now this is an example of um, uh, rotor. Um, the idea was to probe the work um, generated by the rotation around a single atom in a, a molecular rotor. And um, measuring um, uh, translation uh, in a rotaxan, this is, uh, in fact, okay, this is never easy, but this is much more easy than probing a rotation. A rotation, this is something that has never been uh, evidenced by uh, AFM before. So we have um, uh, measured uh, pulling forces on this um, rotor, uh, which has been synthesized by Claire Camerer and uh, Genael Rappen in uh, Toulouse. So we have here in blue uh, the um, rotating part. Uh, and here, this uh, ruthenium atom, in fact, link the rotative and uh, static part of the, of the motor. And we have here um, a linker to pull with the, uh, with the AFM tip. So we have five arms, and the linker is attached to one of the, of the arm. And we have uh, three compounds which uh, differ uh, by the, the spacer. So a small part attached to um the the arm before the linker 
and uh, these are the results. So this is work in progress, in fact. Um, the force curve looks like this. We have here a kind of uh, signal, which is, uh, um, uh, let's say, a zone in the peak where the force stay um, relatively constant or slightly uh, increased, but does not follow the uh, expected behavior that we attribute to the rotation of the, of the motor because um, it means that the tension it release is released in the system, which uh, can be due to uh, the rotation. And in fact, the, the length of this uh, characteristic signal varies with the size of uh, the spacer. Uh, when we use a longer spacer, like here, you can see that uh, this signal is, um, um, the, the length is, is, is higher. And in fact, is, uh, it is um, as if we in fact, we're increasing the diameter. This, this spacer, in fact, increases the diameter of the, of the rotor. So here we have a clear signature that what we see here is this uh, rotation. And if we pull uh, really slowly, you can see here those fluctuations, which corresponds to the, 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 the motor that rotates and then pull on the uh, AFM tip while uh, rotating. And, and the force that um, is uh, exerted by the, the motor on the FM tip, even against a load, because you can see that we apply uh, a certain load, um, this is 15 piconewtons, which uh, correspond to uh, three kilocal uh, per mole. Okay, that's it for. Um, uh, interlocked um, systems uh, like rotaxons uh, and, and uh, molecular uh, rotors. Now we um, I will discuss um, a system which is made of helices, but which can also be considered like a machine because you will see that it can um, produce uh, high forces. So this is um, synthetic folamer, uh, which is based on uh, oligoamides. And you can see here the uh, interactions that drive the folding in uh, helices. And uh, we have uh, studied systems um, in which we have between uh, five and 33 uh, units of um, amides, uh, uh, aromatic amides. So we, ha we have been pulling on these uh, helices to unwind the, uh, the helix. And this is the force curve that we obtain. You can see here a clear um, plateau, which uh, corresponds to the uh, breaking of the interactions in a series. It means that we progressively open the, the helix. And the... The distance here, so the length of the plateau, exactly corresponds to uh, the difference uh, in length between the folded and completely unfolded uh, structure. And the unfolding force is um, very high, 120 um, piconewtons, which is very high if we compare to biological alpha um, helices. And we have also evidence that um, the unfolding process was completely reversible. The helix is, the helix is able to extend uh, up to 3.8 times its original length. But when we progressively decrease the tension, you can see that the helix, in fact, rapidly rewinds against the load that we exert with the AFM cantilever. And since this is uh, at, perfectly, uh, at perfect equilibrium, we can uh, calculate or estimate the delta G uh, of, this, uh, of this process, which is in fact really huge as compared to uh, biological helices. And the refolding is also really, really fast. Uh, less than 10 microseconds um, under the mechanical load.
No, what happens if we replace uh, quinoline uh, units by naphtyridine ones? So they are still um, amides, uh, but uh, previously, so the, 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 the first list I showed you, it was uh, quinolines. And now we have uh, replaced quinolines units by uh, naphtyridines. So they have a wider diameter than the quinolines um, helices, uh, but they involve the same local non-covalent interactions that drive the folding. So these are the same interactions, but the di diameter is uh, wider because you see here the uh, angle between two uh, successive units, uh, which is smaller in quinolines and higher in uh, naphtyridines. So this is done in collaboration with uh, Yvan Huck uh, in um, Munich. He, synth he synthesized the, uh, these systems. <clears throat> and um, they designed this uh, tri-block. Uh, we have a block of naphtyridine um, at the middle of two um, blocks of uh, quinolines. Um, we use this system to, to have an internal reference because we have studied before uh, the response of quinoline units. So that was interesting to have a kind of uh, reference. That's why we um, designed this system and also to avoid uh, hybridization of this uh, helix uh, naphtyridine, which has the tendency to, um, to do um, triple helices, in fact. Uh, and this is um, the force curve that we obtain when, when pulling. And uh, you can see that we first detect a peak at a smaller force and then two peaks at higher uh, forces. So here we attribute the first peak to uh, the unwinding of the uh, naphtyridine helix, which has a wider diameter Then we can uh, unwind it at um, lower force. Um, so this is about half the unfolding force of the quinoline. But what is really interesting, and we didn't expect this, is that here we, uh, in fact, have two signals for the unwinding of the two quinoline uh, units. And normally, because they unfold at uh, the same force, we expected only a single signal for the two, uh, the two blocks. But no, we have two uh, different and separated signals. The, the, it was something that we didn't expect. So to understand uh, what happens, we uh, have prepared uh, this uh, system, which is in fact um, a quinoline helix, but in the middle of the helix, we have this uh, CH2 bridge. Because in fact, just uh, because of um, synth synthesis issues, we had to introduce this CH2 unit between the quinoline and naphtyridine here, just because of, um, of the synthesis. So we, uh, in fact, uh, suspected that this bridge could, um, in fact, induce this strange behavior. That's why we uh, in introduced this bridge between two uh, segments of uh, quinolines. And indeed, that's uh, what we observe. We have, uh, in fact, a response of the system like if we had two independent uh, helices that uh, are under uh, mechanical load. So it means that a single additional carbon atom between adjacent units, a single atom, um, has a dramatic effect on the mechanical response of the helix, probably because there is a kind of a small difference in alignment of, um, of the segment that uh, induce, uh, induces this, uh, this behavior. Okay, um, I come to the end of my talk and now with this uh, difficult exercise of 
potential application achievable in, in the mid, uh, intermediate and long term. Uh, so for the first um, uh, time scale, so between one and five years, um, to measure the molecular network during chemomechanical cycle is something that uh, would be very, very interesting um, because we could uh, measure the efficiency of energy conversion. So uh, all the experiments that I showed you before, in, in all those experiments, the, um, uh, the, the AFM tip in fact, um, drives the system out of uh, equilibrium. And we use the FM tick, for example, in the example of the rotaxan to move the ring to the order station. And then we see the ring that moves back, uh, pulling on the FM cantilever moves, moves back to the preferred binding site. But it would be very interesting to do it um, using a stimulus, like light, like a chemical fuel, for example. Uh, to measure, in fact, the energy conversion. So the, the, the stimulus would be used to uh, make the ring um, move and exert uh, the force on the uh, AFM cantilever. So this is really a conversion between, between the stimulus and uh, mechanical energy. And we could uh, measure the efficiency of this uh, energy uh, conversion. This is something that has been done um, by Hermann Gobe um, early in, in, the, in, in the 20s, I think. Um, but in this case, it was on a polymer, azobenzene polymer. And in this case, um, many units, I mean, thousands of units uh, switched together, uh, activated by light to um, convert uh, the light into mechanical energy. But this is done on thousands of units. The idea here is, uh, would be to, to do it um, on a single, let's say, bond uh, level uh, to, to measure this, uh, this conversion. And this is something that should be possible. Um, this is only a technical problem that uh, we have to adapt AFMs. Uh, couple them with, um, uh, let, let, let's say, um, microfluidic channels to uh, change um, the medium during uh, while keeping trapped the molecule between the tip and the surface, which is really tricky, but this is only a technical, uh, let's say, challenge. Um, the next one uh, at the midterm is to um, optimize the combination of bonds and conformation to design more performance system because uh, organisms and machines move by exerting forces on their uh, external environment. And the upper limit of force outputs uh, affects the performance uh, variables, like for example, the maximum load that can be transported by the machine. And also other criteria like um, fuel consumption or uh, maximum speed that can be reached um, are also important. And in fact, I rely on these um, on this study on this paper. So uh, molecules, muscle, muscles, and uh, machines: universal performance characteristics for uh, motors, where they show that there is a scaling. A trend of net force outputs. So the force outputs that can be uh, produced by uh, machines, in fact, scales with uh, the motor mass. You can see here all the data uh, on this line. Uh, they have been uh, obtained on, on different um, macroscopic structure, macroscopic motors and machines. And you have here uh, at very low um, mass, of course, the biological machines. And here, I will uh, zoom to this uh, um, after, um, the synthetic molecular machines. And here, uh, indeed, if I zoom to this, um, to this region, 
And uh, if I put um, here the different system that I um, showed you, uh, so the um, aromatic amide helices, the oligorotaxin foldamers, the hydrogen bonding uh, rotaxin, the ruthenium based uh, motor, and uh, the azobenzene polymer of, um, of GOB, you see that they deviate from this um, linear scale. And here, these are uh, the biological uh, motors that are on this, uh, on, on this line. But here they deviate, uh, and they can, in fact, um, produce a high force uh, output. So I think that if chemists uh, play with, um, with the nature of bonds, with the conformation of the, of, the, of the molecules and all the possible chemistry, we can indeed uh, maximize this um, force output. And the third uh, challenge on the very uh, long term, um, this is the concerted action of uh, molecular machines. For me, and, and this is related to the, the challenge the, and the question I, I, um, I asked. Um, for me, this is not clear how we, we, we can really do this. Um, so the idea is to really effectively exploit the mechanical work that is produced by uh, the directional movement of the molecules. So either a rotation or a translation in the macroscopic world. So it means that we have to make molecular machines work together. And the big idea would be to, uh, to try that they accomplish uh, more than the sum of the individual uh, molecules. And this is the end of my talk. So of course, I would like to uh, thank my uh, PhD students and postdocs uh, who have uh, realized this nice work. And uh, in particular, uh, Perrine Lucis, Tiziana Svaldo, Damien Sloisman, Florian Deveau, uh, and uh, Shun Li. Uh, my collaborator, uh, Charles-André Fustin at the University of Louvain, David Lee in Manchester, Fraser Stoddart in Northwestern, and Ivan Huck in uh, Munich, and those agencies for uh, funding. And of course, thank you very much for your attention. I like the, I like the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thank, thank you very much, Anthony. That was, that was great. Um, it's a very, very interesting talk. So we've got a, we've got three questions in the chat. Um, just to remind to anyone, if you've got any questions that you want to ask through the chat, please do so. Um, if you want to ask a question just verbally, just remember we can redact it before this is posted online. So if at your request, so feel free to ask anything you want and then we can always cut it later on. So please take the opportunity to engage while you have it. Um, so the first Question from Stephen. Do molecular systems have different flipping frequencies, variation on the, yes, that is specific to the functional, yes, exactly. So um, the, the intensity of the fluctuations and also uh, the, the rate uh, is different uh, from one interaction to, to the other one. So this is different, for example, for the oligorotaxins and for the um, oligoemides for the mirror. Yes, so it depends on the kind of interaction. Um, <clears throat> have you measured molecular chains that have uh, isobenzene residues to observe cis trans dynamic? Uh, no, but um, as I mentioned, Herman Gobe did this. So it has been done by four spectroscopy. Um, however, this is not clear from that paper if they really realized it or if this is a kind of uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical curves. Yeah, I wanted um, to mention that you could test uh, a single residue. You could get that kind of resolution instead of testing a, a large number of residues simultaneously to test them just one or two or three. 
You mean one, yes, one or two or three uh, isobenzines? Yes. Uh, uh, yes, if, if, if somebody synthesized the system, uh, we could do it. <laughs> um, the problem is that, um, I'm not sure that it will work anyway, because um, the problem is that we need a sufficient difference in length between uh, the open and contracted form to be detected. Uh, and I'm not sure that the difference between the cis and trans uh, conformation of the azobenzene is sufficient to detect a difference in length if we have only uh, a few units, in fact. We, uh, in fact, we should calculate the minimum length uh, which would be requested to detect a clear signal um, uh, due to this change of conformation between cis and trans, yeah. So if you were able to do the same measurement simultaneously on thousands of molecular residue, do you think the energy required to move the rotaxan in one direction would be a simple linear combination? Or do you think there would be a threshold where you get an emergent property and become a material? Uh, OK, I have to reread it. <laughs> Sorry, I can explain that a little bit better if you'd like. Uh, but okay, um, this is not possible to, to measure simultaneously. I mean, doing force spectroscopy on um, thousands of molecules. This is possible on two to three molecules because this is something that happens um, when we try to do a single molecule force spectroscopy. Sometimes on the surface, we have molecules that are very close and then with the FM tip, we pick two or three molecules at the same time. This is, this is something that we try to avoid. Uh, but okay, this is something that can happen. Um, I'm more thinking like theoretically. Yeah, yeah. I gather um, that you can't have a thousand or, you know, yeah, yeah. 20,000, a million AFM tips. I get that. To, so the, the energy required to move. It would be a linear combination. Huh. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, but th this is really interesting, but I don't know. Um, I'm just thinking conceptually, yeah. you know, you're moving one thing and that gives, let's just give it an energy of one. And then you put one next to it, then you get an energy of two, and then three and four. You multiply yes. that over and over and over and over again. Is it just a simple trend where, you know, when you get to the millionth residue, if you could push a million down and then a million back up, would that be your energies? If it's one for one, then it's a million for a million. Or do you eventually get some kind of curve to it and you get a material interaction, which would be, I guess, indicative of a, an emergent property. These things are working more of a sum of their parts. Yes. Um, this is a complex problem. I, I think that it will not be simply the sum. Uh, also because when we, we pull different things in parallel, you don't have simply the addition of the different stuff. So I'm right. sure that, yes. And also you have also the, the influence of, because even when you, you pull on the single on the single molecule, you can detect that sometimes um, the behavior differs from one time to the other. If you pull the very same molecule, uh, many times you see that the behavior changes. So it means that if you pull on a, a huge amount of molecule, they, they can all behave differently, in fact. So what you will get uh, is will not be the sum, but it will be something which is, uh, let's say, um, random. It, yes, but it would be really, really interesting, and that was it is linked to, to my um, to my last challenge for for the longer term, uh, how we could in fact uh, make that the molecule uh, act in a concerted way. Uh, and how we could 
uh, in fact, um, do um, work that corresponds to um, something which is higher than the sum of the individ individual molecules. But this is not a simple problem. No, 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 not at all. I'm just saying conceptually. Yeah, sure. But that's interesting. Um, so at the start of the talk, you mentioned rectifying Brownian motion. How does the molecular work you measure vary with temperature? Um, yes, we don't know um, because, of course, it should uh, influence. Uh, but we don't know because this is very difficult to, uh, to measure at uh, higher temperature uh, because of problems of uh, stability of the FM at higher temperature. Uh, of course, we could decrease the temperature also and, and uh, try to see the effect. It should influence, but we, um, we, didn't, we didn't check. Uh, what are the biggest challenges for doing this work? Uh, finding the right system to analyze, attaching the molecules to right places, something else. Um, yes, finding the right system, but um, I'm very lucky that uh, people uh, give me amazing molecules. And <laughs> so I just... I just wait and, and people ask me to, to measure very amazing molecules. So, um, and of course, molecular machines and, and those functional molecules are um, typically a very nice system to, to study uh, by force spectroscopy. Uh, but of course, this is very difficult to, uh, to prepare the samples because um, we, we want to increase the chance that we pick up only one molecule. And for this, we have to use strategies so that we have isolated molecules on the surface. So we cover um, the samples with, with uh, shorter molecules and we use um, solution in which we have a mixing of the molecule of interest and short uh, molecules to, to cover the surface. So the resulting sample is made of um, most of the molecules are those shorter uh, system, and from uh, at, 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 um, some sp space on, on the sample, very isolated uh, molecules of interest. So that means that uh, indeed the, the the chance to pull only one molecule is very high, but we cannot exclude that uh, we we pull on bundles of molecules. We can see it on the first curve and we can exclude those experiments, but um, the preparation of the sample is something which is really, really important uh, and, and very challenging. And we have to try different strategies for each new molecule that we investigate. Uh, I think that's it for the chat. There was one more uh, second question yeah. by Ben, unless you already tackled this, and then Amar has his hand up, and uh, I have a potential closing question, but... Hello, Amar. Uh, hi, and, and Sophie, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Wonderful talk as usual. Thank you. Um, I'm, I was trying to think about mechanochemical coupling that maybe you haven't seen before. And one I was thinking that I haven't seen um, is whether, my understanding is that you can use tapping mode and you can drive that at certain frequencies and whether it's possible to get some type of resonances between the macro scale cantilever and the, the molecular motions that are obviously programmable through through any one of the you know the molecular machinery that you've used, um, it, it's just a phenomenon that I haven't seen. Have people seen it with proteins? Have they seen it with covalent bonds? Have they tried to get resonances? Um, and is that even feasible? Is the 
time scale, length scale, um, and energy scale or force scale um, feasible for that type of thing, quite irrespective of what it could serve in, in some sort of function. But is that sort of thing possible? So when you mention the resonances, do you, you mean those kind of fluctuations or? Uh, I mean, it's my understanding that you can do tapping mode AFM. Yes, so instead of force spectroscopy, you just do this tapping mode. Correct. Right, but can you drive that at different frequencies? And can you drive that at different force loading rates or something? And can you produce mechanical coupling to the molecule that hits the resonant frequency where it's the force and then oh, getting over the barrier and everything happens to hit that resonant frequency. So I guess force, the force spectroscopy of, I, I don't know, yeah. Um, y yes, I, I think this is some, I think that's what you suggest is something which is close to the uh, track technology that is used by uh, Interdorfer. And yes, indeed, this is possible to induce, in fact, or let's say to measure the interaction by this uh, change of frequency while scanning uh, the sample. Yes, this is something that in principle is, is, uh, is possible because when you have this binding, uh, of course, the frequency will change. So you can detect it and then you can have a map of uh, this change of frequency and a map of the of the interactions. I don't hear you anymore. You're muted. <laughs> Am I? You're muted. I'm, I'm muted. Oh, wait, once more. <laughs> are we back now? Yes. My fingers, are, sorry, uh, sorry. Instead of scanning the sample, approach and do your approach and return curve, right? But once you know you are attached, can you then begin to go through that frequency response and go faster and slower and, and so forth? Is that then possible? Um, it, it's, it's really trying to get at that idea of, of because the cantilever is already a macro scale object, right? It's half a millimeter long, right? It's, it's big. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so kind of building that conceptual, that, that connection, I just wonder if there are other interesting ways that haven't yet been explored or maybe have been explored, but I've seen, you know, through folks who are looking at covalent bonds or, or proteins, but yeah. Um, this is a, this a is indeed some, yes, yes. This is indeed something that, in principle, ca ca can be done. Uh, but <laughs> technically, this is uh, very challenging. Technically, it, it is. Uh, and you mentioned if you had if you had a tip that wasn't attached to just one molecule but attached to many, would that simplify the, the technical issue? Because you know I'm also reminded of the fact that single molecules are often misbehaving. One wants to behave nicely, the, but the other the other one doesn't. And so often mm -hmm. nature has a couple of responsive molecules all working together, but some of them are misfiring, right? Mm -hmm. um, and whether, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm just sort of playing with the, with the ideas. Um, uh, yeah, so, I, hey, look, thanks very much for entertaining the question. Um, great to see you again. Thanks to you. Yeah, bye now. Yeah, Alex, if you want to, you've got your hand up, you can ask yours or interject. <clears throat> uh, sure, I was just, Amos got me thinking about a million different things now, which is excellent. Um, no, I'm thinking you, you have the, the spacer molecule, and then what you attach to the AFM is, is just a long, uh, I can't remember what the exact chain was, but now I'm just thinking, well, if, if you could ever make that dendritic, so 
that can split. So you're still attached to one cantilever, but now you've got maybe three, four, whatever, maybe, I don't know how you're going to do it, but then you could move more than one at the same time. I'm not sure if that would work, but that's why Mars got me thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> we should try. <laughs> that actually sort of leads in a little bit to a question that I had. So I might have missed it because although I've seen these force curves before, it always takes my brain ages to understand what I'm looking at again. You, if, if we take the, the Stoddart oligo rotaxane, because it's easier for me to remember, you, you show interactions breaking one at a time. I can't remember with the Huck hel helixes, but when I see multiple non-covalent interactions all working together, I often think of cooperativity. Is that something you ever observe? So when one bomb breaks, multiple break, or do you set the force specifically so that you only see an individual, you can encourage the system to allow it to only break one interaction at a time and then you that's when you see the the shifting can you can you interrogate cooperativity is what i'm asking which i suppose leads into alex's point about if because obviously if you have loads of things attached to something you'd lift it you would want to see that is that something you would want to observe i mean i actually might for some of the work that i want to do possibly using afm so i suppose it's more is that something you can observe but you set up your experiment to avoid seeing no, in fact, we, we do not avoid, so we can observe um, interaction that breaks one after the other, but we can also uh, observe uh, interaction that breaks uh, at the same time. But this is something that we, we do not uh, consider for the moment because we were interested in measuring one uh, interaction. But of course, this is something that we could uh, look through uh, to let's say try to, but this is very difficult because then we have big peaks and we don't know exactly to uh, how many interactions they, they correspond. So that that would mean that would need um, a very um, thorough analysis to try to extract information from this and see indeed if, uh, for example, a peak that corresponds to the rupture of three interactions corresponds to three times um, the force of one uh, interaction. But this is something really, really difficult to, to analyze because when those, those peaks that correspond to the rupture of many interactions are not um, really defined, they, they don't have, a, um, let's say, a nice shape, and then this is difficult to analyze. But this could give some answers in it. Then I had one, I'm conscious of time, I had one more, which was right at the very beginning, when you introduced everything, you talked about using single molecule characterization to try to understand about how systems work. And you made a brief discussion about how the AFM technique allows you to determine that the polymer that you have has better force properties let's I'll refer to it as that I'm sure that's a terrible way to describe it but it's 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 a better polymer than nature's polymers how does this technique fit into materials design right now is it very much like a, a sort of a fundamental you're sort of doing your proof of concept work where you're you're gathering information that allows you to show people that you can determine how the materials behave as a molecule but have you taken it to the extent when you can translate that to a materials property that you can predict from the AFM? Is, is that possible? Obviously, I guess there are multiple factors around it. I'm not saying it's easy, but as in, could you add the information that you have? And you talked about making these small methylene group changes in your systems, these really subtle effects that alter how they behave when you take a helix and cut it in half. Can you, could you do similar things with the AFM and then understand how it might affect a greater material? Or is that a bridge too far? Yes, um, there is still a bridge, but uh, this is something that people start to investigate in it. And there are um, not many, but a few examples in the literature where they, they made the link between the single molecule behavior and the material properties. Uh, but this is really in its uh, infancy. Okay. Great. Um, that's, that's it from, from me. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any more. We are over time now. Alison, you wanted to wrap up. So, Well, uh, I, I am aware that uh, we're seven minutes over time. And 
you had uh, posed a challenge to the group, which I'll post again here in the chat. I'm wondering if only maybe in your closing remarks, you want to reiterate the challenge um, so that uh, people can uh, can answer it and that, uh, there's a little bit more context to it, if you don't mind. So yes, the, this, um, this challenge um, is, um, if you could uh, have idea about uh, what strategies we could imagine to uh, effectively exploit the mechanical work that is produced uh, by the directional movement of molecular machines. So it can be a translation or a rotation uh, in the macroscopic world. Uh, other than the, the few examples that have been uh, demonstrated so far, there are only uh, one or two. Um, and how we can make molecular machines work together to accomplish more than the sum of the individual parts. So how, how can we arrange those molecules so that they uh, work uh, in a concerted manner? 